Hello everyone, it's Michael Shermer here for The Michael Shermer Show. Nice to see you all again. Reminder, this is my day job, publishing Skeptic Magazine, our latest issue on trans matters. It's one of our best-selling ones so far. Uh, be sure and get it. Go to skeptic.com and just click on magazines. You can order that. And if you support the podcast here, please go to skeptic.com slash donate. That's what supports the podcast. Your donations are tax deductible, as the Skeptic Society is a 501c3 nonprofit. And we really appreciate that. My guest today is Louis Thoreau, who in the UK is extremely famous as a genre-defining documentary filmmaker, best known for his explorations of controversial and complex topics. Using a gentle questioning style and an informal approach, Louis has shown light on intriguing beliefs, behaviors, and institutions by getting to know the people at the heart of them. From the officers and inmates at San Quentin Prison to the extreme believers of the Westboro Baptist Church, who my followers here will be familiar with, as well as male porn performers in California to a young woman with eating disorders in London. Louis graduated from Oxford in 1991. He got his break in television in 1994, working for none other than Michael Moore, the American documentary filmmaker who hired him as a writer and correspondent for his TV show, TV Nation. He then went on to make BAFTA winning series, Louis Thoreau's Weird Weekends, When Louis Met, with a series of famous people that he got to know and hung around with at Camera Group, and a series of award winning specials, including The Most Hated Family in America, that would be the Westboro Baptist Church, uh, and uh, Miami Mega Jail, Altered States, and the feature league documentary, My Scientology Movie, which is well worth watching. It's quite amusing. Louis has written three books, The Call of the Weird, Gotta Get Through This, and Through the Keyhole, and he's won number, a number of awards for uh, his documentaries. In this episode, we talk about all those topics, including how to become a documentary filmmaker, religious fanaticism, UFO cults, Scientology, obviously, neo-Nazis, far-right content producers online, prisons, pornography, prostitution, and his long investigation of Jimmy Seville, who many Americans will not be familiar with, but he was one of the most famous people in England, who after he died, it became known that he was quite the pedophile uh, predator. And uh, so there's much consternation about those who knew him, about how everyone seemed to miss the clues. Anyway, so we talk about all that, and most importantly, I think our shared interest in weird things and why people believe them. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. See you next time. I'm going to call this episode Through the Looking Glass. You've probably never heard that one, right? <laughs> I've heard every variation of the Through based <laughs> on sure In have. fact, Through the Looking Glass we can was a working title for a future book that I'm not sure I'm going to write now. But uh, we'll get through this and maybe even <laughs> right. find a few more uses. For well, the, no, for it's, the, like, the it's, it's nice to have you giving. on the show. I appreciate you coming on. Finally, American audiences can access your content. I was just scanning again Amazon. I did a binge watch the last couple of weeks. Of, so if you go to uh, Amazon Prime and you just type in Louis Thoreau, you get my Scientology movie, Life on the Edge, Surviving America's Most Hated Family, uh, By Reason of Insanity, Beware of the Tiger, Under the Knife, uh, Selling Sex, Altered States, Drinking to Oblivion, Miami Mega Jail, The Ultra Zionist. So lots of good content on there. So that's nice. Very I think, cool. I and think Beware one, of the Tiger, of course, is the one that featured Joe Exotic. Just to get that out there, I like to stake any claim I can to to, to sort of foresightedness. Uh, so I interviewed him back in 2012, 2011, in fact. But anyway, you were going to ask a question before. Well, I yeah, no, I just, uh, one reason I admire your work is because you reach so many more people. I mean, you and I kind of travel in the same circles of studying weird things. I mean, my first book was called why people believe weird things. And, and, and you know, you, I have that one. you've explored in, in the world of weirdness. But, you know, when you, in your memoir, which I, I just finished the audio edition of, which is great because you, you're, you're really good at throwing voices of your, of the people you're interacting with quite well. Um, you mentioned, you know, you had to settle for what was it, two to three million views per documentary film as if that was, you know, not as good as you would have liked. Well, how many nonfiction books sell two to three million copies? Almost none, right? I mean, Stephen Hawking's Brief mm -hmm. History, maybe Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion, maybe 
and there's only a handful of others. That's it, you know, in my world. So that's, you can reach a lot more people with a visual medium, I think. That's true. And I, you know, I, I, ca- I came to TV very deliberately because I grew up a fan of TV, but my background was really more literary. My, my father is a literary travel writer and novelist called Paul Theroux. And, you know, it wasn't as though he shunned um, kind of the more vernacular forms of storytelling like television. He's a, he's a TV watcher as well, but I, I definitely grew up thinking I'm supposed to be a writer. And then I noticed that when I wrote something, almost no one gave me any feedback. Like I started in journalism in, in, in New York, working at Spy Magazine in the 90s. And I would, I would really sweat my guts out trying to kind of tweak my prose and, um, you know, just put all the words in the right place. For a 200, 300 word article, it felt like a huge, um, huge amount of stress. And then, as I say, it, it felt like kind of chucking a, a, a pebble down a well. Like you might get a little ping at the end of it. And then when I got into TV, I was headhunted for Michael Moore's show, TV Nation. And, 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 and it just seemed like anything you did, you automatically got, you didn't even have to be very good, but tons of people would give you feedback. And actually, so having slid into TV sideways and without fully kind of, um, you know, it almost feels unearned in some ways, TV, the, the, the natural reach that you have. So it's, a, but I'm, I'm now very grateful for it. Yeah, well, I like your approach, which to me, I, I feels like it's genuine. That is to say, you go in someplace with your camera crew, you knock on the door, may we come in? What's going on in here? What are you guys doing? And it, uh, the sense I have is that you do this because you're curious. You want to know, you know, what is it that you guys believe here? You know, the Westboro Baptist Church or some UFO cult or, or Scientology or whatever. And and uh, and I get the impression that that is kind of your motive. You're, you yourself are curious, not, not just bringing the audience some um, quirky people, but that you yourself are interested in the subject. 100%. And in fact, at a time when, um, when I was first starting out in TV, it was really only my curiosity that I had uh, in my locker as a sort of professional asset. I, I knew that I wasn't a, a, a kind of a TV, uh, a conventional TV presence, like I didn't have any poise. I didn't have Michael Moore used to joke about TV Nation that it was like, oh, it was. He had some joke about our correspondents don't have the same wardrobe. I'm trying to do his Michigan accent; <laughs> it's not coming out quite right. But his basic point was that we were kind of rumpled and not ready for TV, and and I definitely was aware that I didn't. Um, I I just got very nervous, and I, I remember thinking I had a huge sense of imposter syndrome and a feeling of. Um, I don't know quite why I've been given this job as a network correspondent. I was only 23 at the time. And the first job he sent me on was uh, to, to investigate four or five different millennial cults, all of whom had a specific date or a rough date for when the world was going to end. And, and we're, you know, we're, we're more or less certain that the world would be ending quite soon. One of them was saying it would end late, the world would end later that year, 1994. Uh, and so... I got very panicked, and I remember being on the plane, uh, on, 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 flying out to the first group in Oakland, California, a guy called Harold Camping, who had predicted the end of the world. And the only thing that really kept me together, you know, temperamentally, that managed to kind of maintain my equanimity in the situation that was so stressful, was the idea that I'm really excited to meet these guys. You know, I really felt that um, I just was. I felt it was a huge privilege to speak to people whose way of thinking was so much uh, different to mine. And uh, as an insight into different psychologies, and I held on to that, and that's sort of really been my my watchword ever since to try and follow stories that I have a genuine enthusiasm about. And I I find being around people with weird beliefs surprisingly relaxing. I remember we, before the job was offered to me on TV Nation, it was offered to two or three other people. I I heard this afterwards, and one of them was um, Meryl Marco, a comedian. She was married to. David Letterman and was his head writer and then had gone off and done quirky segments here and there. And she was obviously a much bigger and more established person than I was, but she turned it down, this assignment, because she said, I don't want to go and meet a bunch of end of the world maniacs. Like that's going to mess with my mind. Like that'll freak me out for, for two weeks. You know, that's going to, she, she found the idea to sort of um, destabilize in some way it would, it would kind of get, eat, eat, eat at her, get under her skin. And I thought, how, how strange that I regard it as 
something I'm kind of, ex- it, to me, it's the idea of, I feel more relaxed when I'm around people who seem to have views, to have certainties that are, are in, in some way ludicrous or, you know, on the face of it, um, ridiculous. Yeah, I remember going to a camping's place up in, in uh, Oakland. It was in an open strip mall, and I in like two doors down, there was like a psychic reading place, and I thought, that's perfect. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Did you interview camping as no, well? No, I. Uh, it was the, the. I was I happened to be in town on a, a lecture tour, book tour, or something, and and uh, he, he had just been in the news, so I went over there. But the office was closed. I, I think it was the day before the world was supposed to end, so I think they were holed up somewhere, you know, waiting for the, the chariots to come down or whatever. Was, was it because he's pred- he predi- he's dead now? But he predicted the, he predicted the end twice. Once in ninety four, and once I think in t- two thousand and eleven. Mm-hmm. Do you think you saw him for the first time or the, the second? No, it was the later one, 2011. I think it was that one. And he was even more serious about that time. He was like, no, this time there's no mistake. But he, you know, I know you're a psychologist, Michael. He's a great example of a um, of someone who kind of combined irrational uh, religious beliefs with uh, a, a kind of scientific method. You know, he was an engineer by training. And he was a, he was obviously an intelligent guy. And he'd applied his engineering a bit like... Isaac Newton, oddly enough, who also combined alchemical and off-the-wall religious b- beliefs with obviously being the father of modern science and, and the scientific method. And, and with camping, he'd sort of applied himself to, to counting the number of jubilees and counting texts here and there in, in the Old Testament. And it was just a very odd collision of the, of, the ra- of the sort of super rational and the super irrational. Yeah, Newton famously wrote more on the Book of Daniel and biblical prophecy than he did physics. That was, you know, after his his uh, miraculous year uh, when the Principia became the result of that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think people like camping, uh, a lot of the intelligent design creationists, you know, they have, even the flat earthers, they have really good arguments so in their minds. They're good arguments anyway. Uh, you know, they're not the kind of Trumpian conspiracy theory where, you know, people are saying is the entirety of the evidence presented. <laughs> you know, which people? Oh, a lot of people. <laughs> but, you know, the flat earthers will give you, here's our 10 things that we think, you know, support our belief or whatever. And, uh, you know, the end of the world people, they're expressing that cognitive dissonance. This is, uh, you know, Leon Fessinger's theory, which he discovered with the UFO cult in 1954. You know, when they go to the top of the hill to to be whisked away at midnight on December 21st, what would they do if the world doesn't end? His prediction was they'll double down. And that's what they did. So, yeah, camping's reconfiguration of the end of the world. I forget what his excuse was. I think um, the, he miscalculated or he forgot to carry the one when he was doing the, 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 the end times predictions. You know, that kind of thing. They have a whole host of these kind of rationalizations. The last thing, the, the harder thing to do is to say, you know what, I, I was wrong. Um, so uh, just talk about that a little bit with the Westboro Baptist Church and, and the, 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 I think it was the great, one of the granddaughters left the church. And, and, um, and so right. it is possible. By the way, you mentioned Leon Festing. And is that, is that when, is that, is that when prophecy fails? Is that yeah. the book that you're referring to? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Uh, sociological textbook. Um, yeah. So with respect to the Westboro Baptist Church, they're kind of a perfect example of, um, of, of a combination of practices that are, you know, sort of uh, how do, how best to put it? like poisonous, like um, just deeply antisocial. Like they they famously um, picketed the funerals of soldiers who'd been killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's how they really came to national attention. Based in Topeka, Kansas, founded by their uh, Fred Phelps, who they called Gramps. He was born and raised in Mississippi. I mean, there's one sense in which many of their beliefs were simply almost like um, old school Southern Baptist beliefs. That had been preserved, and 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 so he was a kind of more or less probably in his time a more or less conventional fire and brimstone Mississippi um, tent revivalist, but um, he he never moved on from that. And then, and then I, he had he had a particular obsession with homosexuality, you know, above and of all the things he could, you know, he suppose he could have picked on astrology, which also I think the penalty is death for astrology in the Bible. And there's, but for whatever reason. Some people say because they think he was a repressed gay man himself. I don't tend to think that's what it was, but he um, he, he he became more. And more he, it started with his obsession that uh, there was cruising going on in a in a local park, in Gage Park in Topeka, and then that led to pickets, and the pickets became more and more um, vitriolic and sort of poisonous in the way they were phrased. So they used a lot of homophobic slurs, and then his idea was, oh, this is 
this is a doomed nation because of its tolerance of homosexuality, and therefore we need to, you know, and then when the war started in Iraq and Afghanistan, he saw that as a punishment. And when every soldier that was killed, he said, this is a punishment for a nation that tolerates homosexuality. So anyway, it was, on, they had all of that. And yet when you met them, I, I thought, I thought, well, these are interesting guys. I'd done stuff on the clan um, at TV Nation. I'd done stuff on, I'd been to Aryan Nation. So I'd done extremist groups of various hues. Uh, but th these guys, in a way, were something different because it was mainly a single family. And although they were a hate group and, you know, were, were labeled as such by those groups that monitor these things, they also, um, they also projected a kind of, this is going to be odd, this is going to sound odd, but aspects of sort of emotional and social health. Like they were actually functioning people in the wider world. They were educated. Many of them were lawyers. They were relatively well off. And when you were among them, when you were sort of inside the camp, you know, because I actually spent more or less three weeks with them, they were capable of being extremely hospitable, friendly, pro-social, and sort of well-read. And, and um, uh, you know, I remember like, Shirley Phelps, who was sort of running things. She was uh, Fred's daughter. He had 11 or 12 children that I recall. And she, but she, she was one of his daughters, and she was sort of the main person at that time organizationally but she would talk to you about all kinds of offbeat interesting cultural stuff like her husband was interested in Truman Capote and you know you could just talk about you could have a good conversation do you know what I mean and um so it's this really odd thing where in one setting uh they'd be abhorrent and be, be behaving you know just contemptibly and then in another setting you just found yourself warming to them and it, so I, I made that program that was called America's Most Hated Family, and, and it was it was sort of about um, the ways in which, in addition to tormenting the mourners that go to these funerals, they also end up tormenting themselves and specifically their own children, who are deprived of a of a normal life and can't socialize with anyone on the outside world and have to pick it more every day, and th that takes over their life and can only really marry within their own within their own group. And then I went back and tracked them as times moved on. They, in the second time I visited them, Obama was in office and they began thinking he was the Antichrist and that they'd all be moved out to someplace in the Middle East to fulfill the end time program in the book of Revelation. And that I think it's 144,000 Hebrews are supposed to convert. And that they thought this was all about, they got really excited, which partly was, a, was I think, a, a, a side effect of Gramps uh, was freaking out because they had a suit before the um, there was a suit before the the Supreme Court, um, which would have cost them millions of, of dollars. And I think as a result of all that pressure and thinking thinking they were going to be bankrupted, they expressed it as a kind of um, millennial zeal. They ramped everything up, and then the, but all this time people were leaving, and um, and one woman in particular, who who was Shirley's daughter, called Megan Phelps who was one of the most passionate believers when I visited the first two times. And then the third, I went back for a third time and she'd left. I mean, all the time there's people kind of drifting in and out. They, they sort of hemorrhaging mem members uh, every year. And it's just, it is an interesting thing to see how, you know, basically the pull of the outside world and the wish, it's a sort of pro, it's not so much that they think, you know what, maybe this doesn't make sense. It's re I, I mean, it's complicated, the psychology of leaving a group like that. It's, as you say, it's like, when, as you were saying with uh, Festinger and when pro pro prophecy fails, it's not so much, oh, wow, uh, this, I've just disproven my own beliefs. It's a complex interplay of, 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 of a little bit of that, but also a lot of internal social dynamics, feeling like you're, on the, you're, on, you're um, out of favor within the group. I think a lot of what Megan went through was seeing her mum falling out of favour within the group, and you're no longer close to power. And then also maybe the urge to find uh, a significant other, you know, to fall in love, to see the wider world. So there's an interplay of, of, of factors. It's it's obviously not, the, you know, one of my, I'm, I don't really deal that much in the realm of ideas. I'm more about the experience of being among these people, but one of the things I do notice is that um, people don't get tend to get motivated by ideas as such, or at least not by logic. You know, it's very much the case that, that there's there's a real com it's a real complex 
uh, interplay sort of three dimensional phenomena to do with how how you know so- sociology, psychology, and how people interrelate in a real world setting. Yeah. Well, we know from cognitive psychology studies that people do not naturally try to falsify their hypotheses or their beliefs. If you give them specific tasks, they will engage like lawyers in just collecting the evidence to support it. And it's really hard to get them to uh, try to falsify their beliefs. And even asking somebody in a debate or conversation, well, what would it take to change your mind? Most people are dumbfounded. They're like, um, hmm, gosh, I don't know. And then maybe you have to suggest a few things. It's it's really hard. It doesn't come natural. So, you know, we can't blame people. But the other thing about that I like about your films is is to what extent these people are normal otherwise. It's like the, like the QAnon, the study of the people on January 6th. Who were these people? These QAnon rigged election crazy nuts. And turns out they're normal people. They have jobs, doctors, lawyers, engineers, students, grad students, and so on. They, they, they have business owners. They just picked up and said, this is my 1776 moment, and I'm going to lose my mind for just this one day. <laughs> and then they go back to work, you know, and they have families, they have jobs, they, they, they maintain their bank accounts, and they keep gas in the car. They, they somehow manage to function. So it's almost like there's this logic-tight compartments in there where they, they hold things separately. And, and you must have experienced a lot of that. Like, you walk in there, and it's like, this is a normal person other than this really weird thing that they believe, the UFO is coming or, or whatever. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I used to say the weirdest thing about weird people is how normal they are. You know, you expect that um, one, one piece of irrationality in their thinking will somehow infect their entire outlook, but that's almost never the case. And also that um, really very, very often, you know, almost always they're motivated by the same desires that we all are. And, you know, even that hard line between weird people and not weird people, I totally question that. Like. I'm certainly, if I was on the end of, I'm, there's no question if someone could interview me and discover me to be weird. I just happen to be able to sort of either hide that part or I'm so deep into my paradigm that I, I can't really notice which parts of it um, <laughs> don't stack up. You know what I mean? And, yeah. But, I, you know, amongst other people, when I, you know, early on when I did a story about um, survivalists in Idaho and I went to Aryan Nations and one of the guys I met there was called Jerry Grudel. And he was a, a, a vicious anti-Semite, and, and to the point of almost being deranged. And then I was, we were talking about this and that when, when he was showing me around Aryan Nations, and he, and he took me up a guard tower, and he just mentioned that he was a big fan of Benny Hill, and then began talking about Are You Being Served, a British sitcom from the 70s. And the, the, the sort of the dissonance I had between his anti-Semitism and then his love for a very soft, sort of middle-of-the-road, benign 70s sitcom, in a way illustrated this sort of central tension of, because it's not so much that it's a cheesy sitcom, although it is partly that, but it was also the fact of his, his really, his, you know, behind it was a quest, a kind of craving for companionship. He was trying to bond with me. Another one is like, when I went to Almost Heaven, this survivalist community in Idaho, run by a guy called Colonel Bo Greitz. Have you ever had any dealings with those guys? No, I, I know who he is. He, uh, and he, in fact, he was featured um, in the coverage of, of uh, Ruby Ridge, right? Didn't he show up at the Ruby Ridge? He turned up at Ruby Ridge imagining that he was going to be able to talk Randy Weaver. Um, and I think, in fact, in the end, his intervention was helpful. I, I have a feeling he talked to Randy Weaver and um, Randy Weaver came out from his um, his home and, 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 and Bogart successfully de-escalated that situation. And and Bo was, you know, I think he's still alive, but he's very old. He, he was a decorated uh, Green Beret and uh, said, claimed to be, I have no reason necessarily to doubt him, the real-life model for Rambo. And he'd established this little community of survivalist, fellow-minded compadres who'd listened to him on shortwave radio in the 90s, and they'd all gone up there to this plot of, of land that um, that Bo had, had bought, more or less speculatively, I think. I think he actually was trying to make some money selling the parcels. And it was the safest place in America. And these guys were all up there. And I only mention it, apart from the fact it was an extraordinary, sort of quintessentially American scenario, you know, like this almost like a new Jerusalem on a hill where we're all going to look after each other's rights, quasi socialist in some ways. Like we just, we don't, we're not going to use money. We just tr- trade our labor, you know? And, and if you work for me and do this for an hour and I'll do that for an hour and, that was the idea. I mean, it fell to pieces very quickly. But one of the guys up there called Pat Johnson, he was extremely nice, but he was a total kind of radical, kind of far right loon. You know, he he sort of thought his thing was like, 
We got to go back to the original con- the state constitutions before the U.S. Constitution. And apparently some of those allowed for branding. Like if you were blasphemous, you'd get branded with a B on your face or something. And he was like, I think it was a pretty good idea. That was his. <laughs> and I remember thinking, this guy's a loon. And then, but he was also uh, automotive minded. Like he, he knew how to fix a car. And I, I remember I'd been driving. I couldn't work out what was wrong with my car engine. And he looked under the hood, and within a few minutes, he's like, well, that water's got to be going somewhere. I just thought, like, oh, the water's disappearing. And he just figured out, he's like, well, if the water's in there, you're pouring it in, then there's a leak because it's got to be going somewhere. Like this perfect example of sort of deductive reasoning. And um, and I thought, how odd that, you know, he combines an ability to analyze an automotive problem, and yet it's also infected with all this this sort of... um, Religious thinking. Is that the guy in the in the film that asked you if you were Jewish and you, you had to tiptoe around that super carefully? Okay, so basically that was a different film. That was one called Louis and the Nazis. And um and that was a skinhead called Skip. And he um he he like a lot of uh well like I guess like many skinheads, I'm gonna confidently assert that he had um uh, far right racist leanings. He can he, he he styled himself a neo Nazi skinhead. So I guess the clue is in the name. But he, I think, uh, what happened there was that was a, a program I made looking at skinheads in and the uh, neo Nazis in in Southern California under the auspice of Tom Metzger, who was then the leading uh, neo Nazi in the in the US. I guess you could say, or certainly one of them. And I had made a decision going into the program that I was not going to say whether or not I was Jewish. Many people assume I'm Jewish for reasons, I mean, maybe because I uh, I don't really know why, actually. I mean, I, I have some Mediterranean heritage, so I guess I look s- somewhat olive-complected and I wear glasses. I don't know if that's got to... For whatever reason, many people assume I'm Jewish, and um, and especially on the far right, and, 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 and I, I can't remember how it came up. But uh, oh, oh yes, I think I, I I had an idea that it would it would wind him up, like it would annoy him that he wouldn't he, that if, if I was Jewish, it would basically annoy him. And I think I said, although we cut this bit out, I said something like, "You know, Skip, here we are in your house. Like, what is the big problem? Why couldn't we just get along? I mean, I might be Jewish, I might not be." I sort of coyly floated the idea, and then he was drunk at that point, and it um, I think some, that that piqued him. And and he, I was tweaking his nose, really. And he began saying, well, "Are you Jewish or not? You've come into my house. Expo- you've exposed me. Expose yourself." And then I, I, I decided, like, I'm not going to tell him whether or not I am, partly out of principle, but also, I suppose, because I thought it was an exciting piece of television to continue the conflict. Although it got uncomfortable to the point where I probably would have told him, except, you know, because once I've said I'm not Jewish. All the tension disappears from the encounter, and I'm kind of caving in a bit if I do that. So that was um, that was definitely a memorable moment. Yeah, um, we know that there's a lot of con artists and grifters and 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 groups that form just to scam people a lot. But the impression I get, all the people you've met and groups you've uh, infiltrated with your camera crew, as it were, they're true believers. They're not trying to con anybody they're not just trying to make a quick buck right they 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 really believe what they're telling you i would say the the vast majority are i think um you know i think one of the this idea of good faith and bad faith i think most of the time dreadful things that you think of uh happen through some kind of a good faith you know whether it's people imagining that the most noble cause one can dedicate one's life to is um you know kind of ethno nationalism of some kind or or, or some kind of r- religious extremism you know that 911 bombers would be a perfect example or or ISIS you know these guys aren't thinking we want to be as bad as possible they're thinking we want to be as good as possible we want we want to get to heaven and and absolutely live scripturally in every aspect and they've taken that to the ultimate conclusion i also think that in some, there's some instances in which good faith and bad faith, there's almost, the line is blurred. It's not totally clear where one turns into the other. 
there's a few exa- even when you think about like when I think about people I've spoken to who would maybe fit into the um the sort of con artist or some form of hucksterism. There was a guy I did a story on called Marshall Silva who 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 ran a, a millionaire mentorship program in Las Vegas. And you would pay him, I think it was five thousand dollars. That guy, right. You would go on the pro- program for seven or eight weeks and Within seven or eight weeks, you would become a millionaire or your money back, right? Which, as long as you did everything on the program. Now, that sounds like a good deal. Like, even me, cynical old me, I thought, wow, that is a tempting offer. Like, $5,000, become a millionaire or your money back. Um, and, of course, it turned out if you went on it and then you didn't become a millionaire and you asked for your money back, it was extremely hard to get your money back. And whether or not he believed... Whether or not he really believed his um, his program offered something real is extremely hard to say. And I think, you know, I, I suppose it's some, you know, I think it was Nietzsche. I've got a bad habit of, of misquoting Nietzsche, but, um, you know, it was Nietzsche who said that all true deceivers uh, have to believe in themselves utterly or there's some, there's some, in order to be convincing, you sort of have to drink your own Kool-Aid is the basic idea. Have you seen you that? Know, do- I, I have think, you seen that documentary film? No, I'm not. I'm not your guru about Tony Robbins. No, uh, no, but I believe it was made by. If it's the one I'm thinking of, it's it's a relatively. I don't want to be unco- like so sympathetic. Yeah, portrait yeah, of him, much. is yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They follow him I'd around. I'd be curious for to a, see it, and a, I actually think, yeah, they follow him around and they see, and they, it's an intensive Tony Robbins session, and they he's going to work on people and getting them to change their lives and, and, and kind of just, just kind of have breakthroughs, have breakthroughs. And, and, um, and I think that's kind of lovely in one way, right? But I think at the same time, you, know, you have a breakthrough on a weekend with Tony Robbins, but does that really carry through? What, where, does, where do you go with that? Right. There's no follow-up. And, and also it's selective what gets shown. Like there was this scene where he has this woman – Stand up, and she's telling her story about um, you know never, not not being happy in her relationship, and she can't seem to break away, and and he, he seems to really love her, but you know it's just not quite there. So he says, "Get your phone out and call him right now." Right. So I mean, there's like three thousand people in this auditorium. The camera crew's right in her face. She <laughs> she calls the guy at work or wherever, and she just dumps him right there on the spot. And, you know, everybody cheers and gives her a lot of love. And he, you know, and Tony's like, this is empowering. She goes, I feel empowered. But now what happens the next day or next week? You know, does does she go back to him? Who knows? You know, was that a good thing to do? I don't know. What would a therapist recommend if you're unhappy in a, in a relationship? You know, and, and, you know, it's so different from, you know, the way everything else is done in, in the self-help movement. Yeah, well, I mean, in, although, you know, I'm sure there's, there's overlap as well because there's so many. The self help movement is such a broad church, but it does. It reminds me as well of stories I've done in the in the in the South about revivalist um, church meetings uh, and and kind of healings and miracles type services. You know where they um, get someone to. I mean, I've I've never seen this up close. I've seen videos of it. Someone who's got crutches and then they kick the crutches away and he hobbles around for a few minutes. It's like oh, or a few seconds rather, and it's like. He's healed, and you think like, yeah, he's healed, or maybe he can walk for a few seconds. Do you know what I mean? And then he has to get the crutches. Like that isn't necessarily a miracle. Oh, that and, was and one of the ones that the, of, you know the one r- that Randy exposed uh-huh. with Peter Popov, where like some little old lady would walk into the to the tent, and they say, "Well, ma'am, would you like to sit in the front row?" Oh my God, yes! So they put her in a wheelchair and they wheel her down here to the front row and then he comes around and lays hands on her and tells her get up and walk and she gets up and, and walks now why doesn't she at that moment yeah. say hey hang on i wasn't healed i could already walk but but of course she just don't do that well right? i can because- tell you yeah, <laughs> yeah you don't do that and in fact i had in my oh, it's really interesting isn't it because so much is to do with embarrassment and conditioning Look, when i um did my story on marshall silver as uh, as part as one of the sequences, I, I sat in the audience and uh, not Marshall, but one of his sort of lieutenants who was also a hypnotist, he got me to, I can't even remember the exact details, but basically he, he kind of hypnotized me. Like in, in so far, at least he sort of said, you are feeling very calm. Now I want you to go under now. And, and I found myself, I, I, I need to look at the sequence and remember exactly what happened. But the bottom line is 
I found myself playing along <laughs> without meaning to, like just because it would have been too awkward to say, um, just just stop it, like just stop it. I don't want to do that. I would. It was just easier to go like, but my and he goes, you're a child again. You're in the park. What are you wearing? I said, I'm wearing blue pants and a red shirt. <laughs> you know, because it was the path of least resistance. And then afterwards, like, do you see? It works, ladies and gentlemen. I successfully hypnotized him. And and afterwards, I, I knew I hadn't been hypnotized, but I also felt like it was just it was just a less embarrassing road to go down. And it's the same with when you're up on a you know when I did Marcus and Joni Lamb, where it evangelical couple in, in Dallas, Texas, and I filmed at one of their services. And Marcus Lamb, I think he's still doing it. He was up on stage and people would come up and he just, he sort of pushed them over and they'd fall over because they knew that was what they were supposed to do. And then w- once, very rarely, but once in a while, he'd push someone and they wouldn't fall over. Mm. And then he'd just play it off. He'd go like, that's the power. Like he would just act as if everything had gone to plan. <laughs> that's too funny, yes. But yeah. humans are like, you know, you know this as much as anyone. Like humans... We don't act like you know, or, or I think I sometimes think we in the sort of, or we in the skeptical movement. If we can, if I can club ourselves together, yeah. like I think we there's a tendency to um, to kind of define the logic too narrowly. Logic as oh, logic is uh, kind of behavior that somehow conforms to some sort of scientific method. But there's a sort of social logic around um, aspects of irrational behavior, right? Like that you don't that you know that you're conditioned by so many other things other than truth truth true false you know so that you are there's a real there's a logic to tribal behavior or there's a logic to peer pressure um you know the 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 fear of embarrassment the fear of um of standing out too much you know all of these things are on one level kind of weird you know the other one that springs to mind you know on the question of good faith versus bad faith is is having spent um a couple of weeks meeting inside a um, maximum security mental hospital for pedophiles in Koalinga. Um, it's one of, it's a, um, it's where they send sexually violent predators. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was just very odd, as you can imagine, upsetting as someone, I've got kids. And so very upsetting in many respects, hearing about the details of what they did. But what is striking is the pedophiles also persuade themselves of their own good faith, right? They don't think, oh, I'm going to go around and prey on kids. They persuade themselves that um, the kids consent to the behavior and that it's that it's not damaging that it's a peculiar fetish of modern society to sanctify um children and and view them as incapable of consent um so it's it's across the board like, and 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 I think though at the same time sometimes the people are just doing wickedness out of pure selfishness and viciousness like i i i I have to sometimes remind myself of that because I, I have a natural tendency to give people, um, I suppose it's part of my method in a way to give people credit until I, until I sort of see otherwise. That makes sense. I think if we just, let's just say, take that one to 3% of the population that are psychopaths, they just don't give a shit. They, they don't mind harming other people and just take, set those aside. I think most people are convinced they're doing the right thing. This was, you know, Roy Baumeister's discovery of uh, interviewing serial killers and rapists in prison. Uh, this was kind of the height of the self-esteem movement and that, you know, uh, criminals must have low self-esteem. And in fact, it was just the opposite. They were massively high self-esteem. And to to a man, and they were pretty much all men, they, they really believed that they had done the right thing. They were the ones that were harmed. That guy dissed me. He cheated at the pool game, and I had to hit him. Or he slept with my girlfriend, so I had to, you know, uh, uphold my honor, and and so on. They all had reasons that you know they had convinced themselves. And so this gets to you know Bob Trivers' theory about deception and self deception. Bob, Bob's one of the great evolutionary theorists, so he has this book on deception and self deception. That you know, if you're in a social group. Uh, and people know you pretty well. If you start deceiving or lying, you give off tells, and people can kind of tell if they get to know you that this guy's bullshitting or he's lying. So, but but if you believe the lie, if you really are convinced, then you you you're less likely to give off the subtle uh, uh, body language cues that you're you're lying, and therefore you know that kind of spreads through a group. Like everybody really believes. And so this is what I wanted to ask you about. You know, not just the leaders do they believe, but the followers. It looks like they also believe. So how does that develop? Like, how does a cult leader, you know, an L. Ron Hubbard or Miskovich or 
or a, 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 a Jonestown um, or David Koresh at, at Waco, you know, at some point they must start off like, I know I'm just bullshitting here, but, and then, then they get a few positive reinforcements from their followers. Like, oh my God, you, this is incredible that you got this. Or they tell some psychic, how did you know it was my grandmother that passed over? Oh, well, maybe I actually can do this. And then they start to believe it. And then the followers are more likely to give them positive feedback. And that makes them even more confident. And then you get kind of a positive feedback thing going there. You know, it's a, it's a big question. And I think w what's striking is there are different kinds of uh, cult-like organizations, different scenarios. Like, so you mentioned Scientology. Um, L. Ron Hubbard, he was a single child. I, I, I imagine quite a lonely child growing up in Montana. And, and as you know, l lonely single children very often have overactive imaginations, active fantasy lives. And I think from a, yeah, he was a fabulist, and he was by his by profession became a storyteller. And everything about his life, he was constantly embellishing and making it sound more sensational. And I don't think he knew himself half the time which parts he was making up. You know, I think he treated his own life uh, as though it were a novel with him as 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 a hero. And you know how much more exciting it would be if if maybe you know he does these rituals. I mean, there's, a, there's obviously several great books on Scientology, but especially Lawrence Wright's um, mm -hmm. um, The going clear. Uh, going clear. And he talks, you know, there's a section takes place in Pasadena where Hubbard is experimenting with Jack Parsons doing kind of black magic sex rituals, masturbating on little bits of parchment and kind of presumably um, intoning in kind of maybe in Latin. It was all in, influenced by Alistair Crowley. Anyway, so he, I don't think it is, it, he's a great example of the good faith, bad faith distinction feeling faintly like incomplete. Like, I don't think that really describes, he's not thinking like, how can I, I know there's a famous quote where he said, like, if you want to make a lot of money, start a religion, but that doesn't really explain. I think he genuinely believed most of the stuff he was coming out with. And I think, it, you know, and the other thing is, as you know, outlandish beliefs is not necessarily a marker of cult like, um, practices like it's not about what you, know, you can be, you can be in a benign ufo group where you're like let's turn up for, for half an hour every week and you don't need to pay anything and i'll channel an alien for you you know or you could be in a in a corporate uh you could be in a you know fortune 500 company or a law, a law firm or or indeed some military organization it could, it could have cult-like practices anyway that being said uh so the mechanisms with scientology I think they just got implemented and tightened over time. And I think when you were in his inner circle, uh, the closer you were as time went on, as he attempted to um, establish an organization that would promote his beliefs, you, you were traveling on the free winds on a boat. You know, no, there's no more perfect place probably to institute cult-like practices than a boat. Where are you going to go? <laughs> you know, you're basically, you know, you can't, you can't go anywhere. Uh, and then you've got Miscavige. So, so the, there's only two, strange to reflect, only two leaders in the history of Scientology, though, it was founded more or less in uh, 1950, I believe. So, um, and Miscavige, who never really has any visions, right? He's never added a single word to the texts of Scientology. He's never claimed to be in touch with an alien, as far as I know, other than um, insofar as it's dictated by the existing scriptures that they live by. And, um, and, but there's Miscavige enforcing, uh, allegedly enforcing a kind of um, cult-like or extremely exacting Sort of religious practices, at, you know, at the secret headquarters out there in Hemet. So, I mean, I don't even know if it, that that begins to answer your. I mean, with with the Westboro Baptist Church, it's just a fa it's a family, but they go out to school. Like they're not they're not. I don't think they're particularly you know the, the classic markers of cult behavior is laid out by. I think it's is it Margaret Singer. I mean, there's a few different, and then there's also yeah. Um, yeah, uh, the psychology of totalism, thought reform. What is that guy? Well, it's like a you know, it's like a diagnostic. About. It's like a diagnostic list. Like here's twenty characteristics. Yeah. And if you have sixteen of them, you're in a cult. Something like that. Uh, I want yeah. to comment one one and funny it's, it's story. It's almost like a Weber, It's like a it's like a Weberian thing as well. It, it's mm -hmm. not a, the ideal mm -hmm. type doesn't exist, but there's little things that pop mm -hmm. up that that are signs that you may be in an unhealthy. Um, Social setting, but anyway, sorry, I interrupted. Go on. Yeah, well, no, but that's right. If I mean, like, like QAnon, you know, if your spouse leaves you and takes the kids because you're so down the rabbit hole, you, you're probably in a cult. You, you're this is probably something bad, right? 
And, you know, the difference between Scientology and, say, Catholicism, well, there's quite a few uh, differences, enough that I think Scientology could be called a cult and, and Catholicism not a cult. But, you know, I mean, it's kind of a loose definition. But, you know, can you challenge the leader? And can you leave without being punished? And, you know, do you get do you have to pay for the secret scripture? Like, I, I think you made this point in your Scientology movie. This would be like uh, not finding out about Jesus' resurrection until, you know, eight years into the courses after $100,000 in, in training. And you get to find out, oh, Jesus was resurrected from the dead? What? <laughs> That's impossible. That sounds crazy. But okay. <laughs> Exactly, yeah, and and in fact, um, you know, it's a uh, we all we all have um, aspects of our uh, life that are guided by irrational impulses, and I often think as a, you know, it's part of the human condition in a way to be at the whim of impulses that are in and of themselves somewhat irrational or mysterious or not not even clear to us. I mean, it's sort of my um, my beef with. Insofar as I have a beef, like with libertarianism, like I, before I did this, I was, I was listening to the show you did with Dave Rubin, and 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 you know, libertarianism is it's all about what you want, and 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 yet it's so. I think half the time it's unclear to many people what they do want. You know, like the idea that wanting something or not wanting something is a self-evident thing, I think isn't always the case. I think people are confused. You know, and I I found this whole. You know, we we had a little exchange by email about about Jimmy Savile because there's recently been a series on Netflix, uh, a two parter about Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile was a British celebrity, a DJ, a charity fundraiser, and he hosted a, a beloved children's TV. Actually, it was a family TV program called Jim Will Fix It, where he did um, he sort of made dreams come true. And there's no exact American uh, comparison because I, I would sometimes try and explain him for Americans. I said, well, there's a little bit of Jerry Lewis. You know, in as much as like a high profile fundraiser who there's something kind of weird about, but really there's no exact analogy because he's involved in the rock world and, you know, as a DJ. Anyway, I made two programs about him, uh, two documentaries. After he died, um, he was revealed to have been a, um, a sexual predator with a huge, just a vast offending history of having preyed upon um, especially children, but actually people of all ages. Why did I even bring him up? I think it was the idea that, um, why did I bring him up? Well, I think it's because a, 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 be a holder of weird beliefs or a person who can perpetrate something as horrific as pedophilia can also have some other side to them that's totally normal or good. You know, I think we have this kind of folk psychology that's that, you know, there's an essence to a person and, and the one worst thing they ever did is how we define them. Uh, this came out, uh, my friend Carol Tavers, the psychologist, wrote an op-ed in the uh, LA Times about this during uh, w the Clinton hearings over Monica Lewinsky. And liberals were kind of wringing their hands about this, like, oh my God, he's our guy, but look what he did with all these women. What are we going to do? And, you know, we have to disown him, or do we have to disown his policies? And, you know, Carol's argument was, look, yes, he did these things over here that were bad with these women, but he does these other things over here that are good. People are more than one thing, Right. And, and, you know, I, I listened to your, your, your um, memoir, and I could tell the tension there you have about, you know, Jimmy Savile and all the interactions you had with him. But can't he be a pedophile and also a fundraiser? He, he did raise money for charities. That's a good thing. He did these bad things. You know, it, there, you can have more than one side. No, absolutely. And, your... and I think in addition, so then the way people squared it was, and you know, you're right, like it was obviously for me, having made a documentary with him while he was alive that sort of revealed him to have been a weird guy but didn't nail him as a pedophile or a sex offender. It sort of left the door open to some untoward sexual interests, but it didn't, didn't definitively say what they were because I didn't really know them uh, at, at the time. But, uh, you know, afterwards when people were attempting to make sense of it, it was obviously a traumatic, you know, only really comparable to sort of Weinstein meets Epstein um really in in terms of its impact on the british um cultural landscape a kind of moment of cultural reckoning a moment of realization that uh, a, a trusted public figure with connections to the, the uh prime minister at the time margaret thatcher and the royal family was was behind the scenes um kind of routinely groping and 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 and, and assaulting vulnerable people so so it became oh well he was doing the charity work 
in order to get access to the children, which I think was part of the truth. But I also think that he was doing the charity work because it made him feel like he was a better person, right? Like, I actually think he was do, which is probably the right reason to do charity work, like to try and be a good person. And I think he thought that, he, he, I think he probably did carry some sense of, it's impossible to know, but my, my supposition is he carried some weight of guilt about what he was doing behind the scenes and, and thought perhaps he could kind of even things out a bit in God's eyes because he was a practicing Catholic. By by offsetting his offending with some by raising millions and millions for charity, so there was that. But I think in addition, because where I what, what it's where I started was with this idea of wanting and knowing what you want. What was also striking was how for for many of the victims, um, and it's hard to generalize because the 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 offending was 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 so indiscriminate and there were so many different victim profiles, but at least for some of them, they did. It took them a, a, a long time, a very long time, to process what they experienced as an assault. Like there was, a, there was, and that, you know, this sense of what, what do I want? And so it got, what goes hand in hand with that? Have I been violated? And 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 to to sort of, it, it's you know, I've, I've noticed it in other cases where I've sp- spoken to people who've been sexually assaulted or or raped, who in the aftermath didn't straight away. Get that it it had it had been a rape. There was some, you know, the classic example that's often used is, well, he couldn't have raped her because she made breakfast for him the next morning, right? Which which comes up sometimes, you know, that, so versions of that scenario come up at trial where you know a defend a defendant's lawyer will attempt to persuade the jury that their client, the defendant, was honourable because you know, how would he, he couldn't have raped her because she made breakfast afterwards or or sent him a nice text saying. Uh, you know, it was nice seeing you. You know, which is obviously devastating to to, to the chances of getting a conviction. But it's a you know, I, I see that as a very understandable aspect of human psychology that to sort of deal with the fact that you've been assaulted sometimes takes a step, a step or two. And 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 for for, for me, the most difficult part of of dealing with of the Jimmy Savile experience was the fact that two of the women who would later become Key to the uh, to his unveiling, unmasking as a as a sex offender in in, a, in in the kind of the first TV program that went there a year after he died. It was called "The Other Side of Jimmy Savile" by Mark Williams Thomas. Um, two of the women uh, had been I, I'd been in touch with, and um, I you know and, and I talk about this in my follow up documentary. If I have to be careful what I say, because you know the, these women still exist under a cloak of of, an- of anonymity for understandable reasons, but really t- knowing that you had a ch- you had a, you had a chance to speaking to someone, but then at, the, at that time they hadn't really recognised themselves as victims, and it had taken years before they'd sort of seen that because one of them had been fifteen, and and after the fact processing it to sort of recognise yourself as a victim, it sometimes takes work, it takes courage. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I was going to say there's a, a number of scientists I know at Harvard and MIT uh, who were have their pictures taken with Jeffrey Epstein because he gave money to different departments. And, you know, the problem they have is, you know, the boss, the president says, hey, can you come down here? We got this guy who's going to give us millions of dollars and he wants to take his picture with you and talk to you guys because he loves science. These are, I think, some neuroscientists. And it's like, yeah, OK. And then, you know. 20 years later, all the stuff comes out, and then now you see online pictures of these scientists with Jeffrey Epstein. And it's like, why are people posting this on Twitter? I mean, what he's dead. Well, I think the sense is he's dead. We can't punish him, but we can get the people that were affiliated with him. And and we, you know, there's there's this kind of sense Thomas Sowell called this the quest for cosmic justice. Somehow there's a cosmic courthouse. And it's all going to get sorted out in the next life. But in the meantime, we got to try try to do the best we can by sorting it out here. And if we can't get the dead guy, we'll get the people that are still alive that were affiliated with him. Definitely, yeah. And I think you know, it's it, it, on one level, it's an understandable impulse. I, I think in general, the the urge to point the finger or to to cast blame is a more or less um, is a universal human impulse and feels deeply satisfying you know like it makes you feel so right when you can 
put someone so squarely in the wrong and, and to make them feel small and make them feel ashamed. Um, so it, it it's it's an it's an ugly it's an ugly impulse and uh, it's it's unfair. But um, and 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 at the same time, these things are so hard to police, and people make out that um, oh well, it, you know, all we need to do is um prosecute more people or be more vigilant and you know that's part of the story but the tr- the truth is is there are there are complicated reasons why people feel inhibited from going to the authorities or 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 why um a kind of inappropriate degree of latitude was afforded figures like Jimmy Sal it's also clear in hindsight um but i think at the time it you know not in any way to extenuate it because it was unforgivable what took place but uh, you know, it's not. It's in, on another. In another way, it's not that mysterious. You know, it's an impulse to not, uh, to sort of, to not ask questions or to cut to to sort of extend more, uh, kind of more more latitude, more liberty to you know a beloved or kind of highly connected public figure, and and you know, it, I, I. But the good part is, I guess, that there is, I think, more of a culture of. Of vigilance, you know, around around um, around celebrities and around. I mean, I'd like to think there. Is, my sense is, you know, we've been through a weird. I don't know about in the U.S. so much, but the U.K. went through a slightly weird convulsive moment of outrage where people began thinking that some ex MP, you know, ex MPs and and former prime minister who were involved. It was like a satanic panic. But you know, and 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 I because I'd, I'm curious about these things. You know, I remembered the original Satanic Panic in the late '80s. You know, Satanic ritual abuse, and I, I was aware that, you know, the idea of believe everyone, believe every allegation, was fraught with issues. But there was a moment where that that was almost like that came back that, like a zombie version of that thinking, came back to life, and 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 to even say, uh, well, there is something called due process for a reason and there is something called the rule of law and and actually the idea of believe everyone i understand why you you know you think that it's important to support it is important to support but you know people who've come forward with allegations of serious sexual assault but it's a it's a recipe for disaster to believe everyone yeah that, it's part of my explanation for the uh, the me too movement and the black lives matter movement and the george floyd movement and the anti-racism movement, most of us can't do anything about these things. You see the video on TV of George Floyd and you're just outraged. What can I do? Well, nothing. I'm I, I'm not a mayor of a city. I don't, I'm not a governor. I'm not a politician. I'm not a policeman. You know, I can, but I can go on Twitter. I can go march and protest. I can, you know, pass this, this uh, rule at my university and make everybody go through sensitivity training. You know, there's, there's a lot we, we feel like we can do because we want to do something. Yeah, absolutely, and I think uh, especially because so much of it was in lockdown. You know, there was a moment of massive, almost um, uh, well, just boredom. Like people were so bored, and and I think uh, I'm going to misquote this, but my my father sent me a quote from a um, sociologist. I'll have to dig it up. And basically, it's along the lines of um, the the main precondition for the for the uh, for, for a kind of revolutionary or, or, or up level of upheaval is massive levels of boredom in the populace, like mm. not famine, uh, not sort of like a shortage of, of bread, but just people being so bored. And it felt like that was kind of behind uh, much of what happened in 2020. People in lockdown just sitting on their smartphones and their laptops, just finding something to um, to get exercised about. Mm-hmm. Yes, and also we all have a moralizing impulse in us, and so much moral progress has been made over the centuries that you know the targets are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so you know we've abolished slavery and and outlawed torture and the death penalty in most countries and so on. And you know where's my 1776 moment? Where's my 1968 where I want to go out and protest the Vietnam War? You know I want to do something and. So the targets are getting a little bit smaller, like, okay, same-sex marriage or LGBTQ rights or something like that. 
And that's all good because we're not there yet. Uh, we still have a ways to go. So, okay, that's fine. But then you end up with like outrage on college campuses over Halloween costumes and cultural appropriation. And to outsiders, this looks insane. Like, what are they teaching these kids these days? And part of it, I think, is the kids just want to, they want to do something. They want their moment. Definitely. Yeah. And I think you sort of see that um, in January 6th as well. I mean, I'm I'm really curious. At times it feels as though, I know this is sort of Stephen Pinker's idea that by and large things are getting better. Then uh, I have my moments of thinking, well, we've got, you know, Putin running amok in Ukraine and, and um, you know, you've got at the highest levels of, of government or the politics, you've got people denying reality and suggesting that there was industrial scale voter fraud. Like I also see a contagion of irrationality um, at, you know, so it, I, I, I think these things are, you know, this is just me sort of spitballing, but I, I, and I, and, and I don't doubt in many measurable ways that there are very positive signs for humanity as a whole, but um, there's definitely the reverse. I mean, I know we, I don't know when this is going out, but it's worth reflecting that today it was announced that Elon Musk <laughs> had successfully acquired Twitter, which mm -hmm. feels like quite a big moment. I don't know about you. Have you got any reflections on that? Do, would you, what, oh, what's your take I, on that? I, I think it's not that big a deal. I, I think we probably won't notice any massive changes. I don't know. I, I see on Twitter, of all places, you know, this is the like the end of the world. This is World War Three, and you know, there's like nuclear weapons, global warming, and Elon bought Twitter. Oh my God! Come on, <laughs> you know, put it into perspective. Uh, I, I'm not sure what to make of the social media, you know, crisis that people seem to think we're in. There's a lot of people that think this is a an, almost an existential threat to our culture and polarization and so forth. Maybe uh, there was another one of those uh, Netflix docs called the. Um, Social Dilemma. Social Dilemma? Which they, yeah. Yeah, The Social Dilemma, where they portray, you know, they interviewed a bunch of these ex-employees at Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and so on, who were kind of self-flagellating uh, for making the like button, for example, as if they were J. Robert Oppenheimer that had just invented nuclear weapons. Oh, I should have never done this. I have deep guilt about this. It's like, come on, it's the like button. Jesus. <laughs> but maybe that's because no, I'm... No, I get that. I think that's a fair <laughs> point. Here's the thing, though, is like, without Twitter, no Trump, Right. And and with no, with Trump, uh, you mentioned global warming. I mean, one of you know Trump is obviously on the global. I mean, in certainly in the U.S. picture, um, doesn't seem to be t terribly worried about the environment. And so you know, I I, I share aspects of your analysis. Like, I, I, in fact, well, or, or maybe I just enjoy hearing a different take because I'm used to this sort of Cassandra-like um, self laceration over over sort of toxic social media but um i'm really curious because i do think that yeah it is it, it, on one level it's just a vast kind of clamorous echo chamber of or or or, or kind of um terror dome of, of kind of competing ideologies um but on another it feels as though it has changed aspects of the world i don't know i'm really i and, and so I, I mean just in an immediate level like here in the uk tommy robinson who's a kind of homegrown anti-islamic campaigner um, he he was straight back on Twitter today. It, it seems far, hugely coincidental. And there's other figures who I know who will be back on. You know, you may be right. It may it may turn out to be nothing. You know, you mentioned QAnon, which is more of a Facebook spawned um, sort of meme or, or whatever you call it, social um, sort of form of well, it's a conspiracy theory. But I find that that's a. I imagine you've looked into that quite a bit because that feels it's got elements of the satanic panic. And then oh, you've does. got kind of a, and it was latched onto by um, anti-Semitism. It sort of it kind of um, breathed new life into vaguely into some old anti-Semitic tropes with the idea of child sacrifice. And then Epstein seemed to give it kind of a, a new kind of credibility with the idea of like, oh well, he was trafficking teenagers, so it, it, it must all be true. I, it's your sense that that's still going on, or or, or is yeah. that is that had its moment? Do you think? Yeah. Oh, oh no, it's still going on. The poll show bo both QAnon and and the rigged election conspiracy theory, uh, especially uh, percentages of of self described Republicans is going up, uh, and probably I'm predicting now it'll probably continue through the midterms and maybe even the 2024 election, especially if Trump runs again. 
especially if he gets the wins the primary for the Republicans. But um, but I've been thinking about this. What does it mean to to believe something like if you really believe that there's a uh, secret satanic cult of pedophiles running out of a pizzeria? What would you do? Well, that one guy did something, Edgar Welch. He he had the courage of his convictions. He really believed it, so he went there with a the gun, right? I'm going to break this up. He left a note for his daughters. I'm you know I'm going in there to, to protect those kids like I would protect you. But most people, uh, Hugo Mercier makes this point, cognitive psychologist. That most people just like leave a a, a, a one star review on Yelp for the pizza. The pizza was kind of doughy, right? I mean. That's not what you would do if you really believed that was happening. It's more of like a mythic belief, like, I don't know if the Democrats are really doing that, but it's the kind of thing they would do, you know, because I hate that Hillary and or, you know, whatever. And then it got, yeah, it got conflated with the Epstein thing. But, of course, his thing was like girls that were what, 14 to 17. He wasn't um, uh, assaulting uh, young girls. But then that got it, the, the age went down at the, at the alleged pedophile ring to children. And then there was some overlap with some of these uh, tech billionaires that are trying to achieve immortality through various methods, one of which was to, like, inject blood from a young child or something like that, which apparently was never done, but it was in the it was in the meme sphere. And I think all that Didn't they got, say Soros was doing that? Right. I right. think the idea was Soros was doing that. I can't remember, but you might, might have been a tech billionaire. I think you make a really good point, which is that um, it's a bit like I was saying with the term want, like, I want this, I want be you know, well, it, 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 it's a, the word is, is just, it's just full of ambiguities. And, 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 and the same thing about belief, you, you know, I believe that, I mean, on the faith, you know, mil- hundreds of millions of Catholics believe that communion wafer turns into the literal body of Christ, right? And, and they'll say, no, I really do believe that. And, and your, your next story is like, well, your idea of belief must be different to mine. Um, <laughs> I think, I think you're right. I think there's a sense in which, People are, um, uh, it, when they attempt to understand how humans behave and how the, how we express ourselves, they're overly literal. Like that, actually, people it, use language, uh, as you say, in a mythic sense, in a kind of ironic sense, in a hyperbolic sense. Uh, there's many kinds of, in an aspirational sense, there's many kinds of non-literal uh, language that, nevertheless, it's not gobbledygook. It's just it, these are different registers. And um, I mean, I and, and so I, you know, on one of it's self-evident, and, and and I think probably at some level, many of the QAnon, maybe this is what you're saying, like it's not so much that they believe it or don't believe it; it's just it's just a helpful kind of fiction, or or, or it's just something that, um, as you say, feels like it has a mythic truth, like it just it has an emotional, <laughs> yeah. crusading kind of truth about it. Uh, and I get that, you know. Well, and it's the my side bias. It's our tribal instincts. Like, well, I'm I'm going to go along with the crowd. We talked about earlier about cults and and social proof. Um, it's like those social psych experiments from the '60s and '70s of, you know, of conformity to the group. You know, like which is the longest line, and people would pick the wrong one if the people ahead of them picked the wrong one, or the smoke in the room, and you know all the yeah, people I like the in the smoke room. in the room one because I totally get that. Like. That's the one where everyone's sitting around doing a a test or something, and then smoke's coming under the door. The person who's being tested doesn't realize that everyone else is in on it. They're plants, more or less. But none of them move to react to the smoke, right? And the, and if no one else moves and reacts to the smoke, then a surprising number of people don't react, right? Right. And so it, this is called social proof. That is, where where do you get your information from? Well, most of it comes from other people that are in our group. And most of the time, this the group will act correctly. It, it, it's like, you know, pull the audience and who wants to be a millionaire? You know, crowd, the wisdom of the crowds. You know, usually they're right about, you know, simple things. Like, there's smoke coming in the room, we should get up and leave. So if nobody, you look around and nobody's doing anything, the information you're getting from your trustworthy group is like, well, I guess there's nothing to panic about. Same thing like in the elevator where everybody turns around and faces the back of the elevator like, okay, I guess I should do that. <laughs> and we make fun of it. We laugh like people are so stupid, so irrational. But really, there's kind of a, a, a rationality in the social evidence we get from fellow group members. And uh, this, again, Hugo Mercier makes this point about, uh, uh, let me let me just set this up and then ask you your opinion on this. To what extent are humans irrational or rational or somewhere in between? Well, 
uh, you know, T- Tversky and Kahneman have famously for decades made, you know, showing us how irrational we are, how badly we are at reasoning through logical puzzles. And that we're just, we're just hopelessly locked into all these cognitive biases, confirmation bias and hindsight bias and motivated reasoning and so on. But Mercy and a few other cognitive psychologists show, in fact, most people uh, don't do that. Most people don't join cults. Most people that join some self-help group, the groups don't become cults. Most people don't fall for the Nigerian spam scam, right? Which is why those guys have to send out 10 million emails to get one person, you know, that wires them the 1500 bucks to get the $5 million or whatever. That most of the time we're pretty good about that. So what is your sense of all your uh, travels amongst the uh, uh, weird things? Well, I that's a great question. I, I feel as though um, life is so complicated uh, and, and our sense of ourselves in many ways is so opaque that decisions that appear to be wrongheaded can, when properly analyzed, have, have a real sense to them. And, you know, the life inside a cult can be extremely rewarding. Can I say that? Like, it, mm-hmm. the, 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 you know, life inside a yes. cult could be, um, you know, and actually there's probably rewards that you would get inside a cult. You know, granted, they'll go along with horrible things like maybe being, you know, have a tiny mattress and working 18 hour days, but you will experience moments of reward and pleasure that you would never get if you led a sort of straight out kind of Benthamite maximum pleasure kind of lifestyle. And, and by the same token, if you, if you, if you sort of went through life saying, I'm going to logically approach my life as a puzzle and, and see how I can, you know, you know, you know, ethically have some kind of egotistical calculus for how I'm going to make my d- decision, like so that I'm going to be as happy as possible and retire, make enough money and figure out how much I need. And you will be making certain sacrifices. Um, there's things that you will lose out on. You know, one of the things I, I think, I don't think I put it in, I, I, I have a more recent book, but it was a, um, it was a Nobel laureate who, 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 who was a survivor of the, of the Holocaust. Um, who, who described was in a Newsweek interview where he described being at Auschwitz, and um, he said in, when he looked back at his life, the times of greatest happiness had been at the work camp in Auschwitz, because just to, to have a few moments rest or uh, just to have one okay meal w- was such a respite from everything else that was going on that the pleasure of it was almost immeasurable. You know, that was the most intense form of pleasure he'd ever experienced. And that's an extraordinary thing to reflect upon. Um, so, you, you know, but your question was about do people, I think by and large people are pro-social, you know, if at the risk of being totally reductive, you know, I'm, I've been doing a bit of gardening and you, you see, you know, some plants, most plants are just trying to be healthy plants. Do you know what I mean? They're just trying to grow and reach for the sun and as long as they get a little water and they're not planted in a disastrous position, that's what they'll do. And I think, I think um, this sounds really glib, but I think humans are are like that, you know. And I think uh, many times I think what we think of, um, you know, oh, what is positive conduct or what is happiness or it's really about health, like social and emotional health. And, and I think most people naturally grow towards that. And um, and and and, and at times. You know, adaptive behavior appears irrational, but actually all it is 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 the best someone can do given the situation that they um that they grow up in. Does it does that mean you're an I feel almost self conscious talking about this because you're you're an actual you know, an expert on this stuff. This is me just based on impressions that I have of being among oh, people. But, but I just know are... that whenever I'm in a world <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I you know, I've I think I've done my work long enough to sort of have some kind not exactly insight, but I know what I've seen and, and when I come away from whether it's Westboro Baptist Church or, um, you know, somewhere like um, a prison, you know, I've done a couple of things in San, you know, one was in San Quentin and Miami Mega Jail, and you see behaviors that on the on day one, I mean, you think this is crazy, like racial gangs, like where you if you borrow someone else's um, checkers board, right, and they're of another race, then they have to be stabbed, and utterly bizarre forms of. Um, of social conduct that are enforced to like a bloodthirsty or in Miami jail, there's a kind of culture in main jail. There's a culture of almost Darwinian survival where fighting is endemic and you have to fight for your commissary and fight for the right bunk. And 
But on day five, day six, like by the time you've been there a while, you, you kind of think, well, it starts to seem almost normal. You you see a kind of um, a sense in it, whether it's because that's the um, it, it, there's some hierarchy of survival that is is replacing you know an absent kind of um, you know the guards aren't sufficiently present, it's not sufficiently policed, or whether they're so bored it passes the time, and so. Um, and when I leave, I go and talk to people, and they're like, those Westboro Baptist guys, they're nuts. Like, they're, you know, they should have their children taken away, and, and you know, they should be locked up, or shooting's too good for them. And, and my guilty secret is I'm thinking like, well, you know, I don't really agree with that. Like, I don't think they should have their children taken away. And what they're doing is kind of horrendous, but it actually, in other respects, there are positive qualities that they exhibit, and... And and it's all so much more complicated. Yeah, in the late '90s, we we were publishing a number of articles on Scientology. Just when the, the some of the ex Scientologists started leaving and posting stuff online, and the church was like suing them and trying to get their hard drives and 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 so forth. It was quite the battle. And by chance, I I, I was going back to Atlanta for Thanksgiving dinner with my best friend at the time. Uh, and one of his friends in Atlanta was Isaac Hayes, the African American singer songwriter, won a Grammy for yeah, Theme from Shaft. Yeah, I mean he's huge, and and he famously was a Scientologist. I mean they made a big deal about it. we have Isaac Hayes in our in our church, and, and he's big. And so there he is sitting across the table from me. So I just asked him, you know, why why are you a Scientologist? What you know what do you get out of it? And he said, Well, Michael, let me. Let me tell you, you know, in my career, I I gained a lot of success. I had money and this and that, and I lost it all. I mean, you know, drugs, alcohol, the whole thing, kind of a typical Hollywood story. And they got me off alcohol. They got me off drugs. They got my life back together. Uh, I owe it all to them. It's like, you know, what do you say to that other than, well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad for you. And, you know, I think there's probably enough of those stories about Scientology, even though you and I are both pretty critical of it. Still, you know, it's not just simple black and white like that. No, and I think um, I, who I think William James said a version of this. You know, William James, the nineteenth-century psychologist, brother of Henry James, and he described he wrote different types of religious experience. I can't remember what the name of it. You'll know the name of the book, but he he he, dis, he described having a degree of envy for people who'd had deep religious experiences, even mm -hmm. though he was a secularist himself. And yeah, I think varieties of religious if you've been among people yeah. in Christ, varieties of religious experience. There we go. And 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 in fact, when you see people in crisis, like is a quote from Albert Camus where he says, "Imagine God without prisons; he'd be so lonely." Like, or or no atheists in a foxhole. That expression, you know, when people are experiencing profound crisis, um, many times they reach for God, and you can tell them that's irrational. But the, you know, they'll be, you know, they can be irrational drinking, you know, and have a positive life, or. Um, or, or ultra rational, and um, dead from from drinking too much. Do you know what I mean? Like I, 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 I do think that I, I'm very, I'm very indulgent. Or I like, I, I, I like to kind of preserve a very open mind towards the positive attributes of, or the positive effects of um, religious belief. And and I know that you know in a kind of Christopher Hitchens type world, uh, or, or, or Richard Dawkins. I don't quite know. You know, I, obviously they're high profile. We're high profile um, secularists, anti-religious people. But I, I, I take the view that there's a sort of there's a kind of there's a there's a sort of greater logic. There's a sort of social context to aspects of re religious belief that, in many re in many respects, is is really positive. Let me read you something. Apologies about for the noise in the background. My um. Oh, that's all right. Youngest child's about. I'm gonna to have to jump <laughs> off in in eight minutes. I'm sorry. To... Yeah, I, I'll give you that. Uh, I was gonna give you the the background story about the uh, starting your own religion. Um, this is what I wrote because I got this story from Harlan Ellison, um, who told me that that he was there at the birth of Scientology at a late 1940s meeting in New York of a science fiction writers group called the Hydra Club. Hubbard was complaining to L. Sprague de Camp and the others about writing for a penny a word. Lester Del Rey then said half-jokingly, what you really ought to do is create a religion because it would be tax-free. And At that point, everybody in the room started chiming in with ideas for this new religion. So the idea it was a gestalt, and Ron caught on to and assimilated the details. He then wrote it up as Dianetics, a new science of the mind, and sold it to John W. Campbell Jr., who published it in astounding 
science fiction in 1950. <laughs> you know, but then I went on to say, you know, it, it, of course, it's, it sounds like a completely crazy story, but any religious origin story, if you heard it for the first time, and you weren't used to it. You know, Jesus was born of a virgin. How does that work? And he was resurrected from the dead and rose people, you know, miracles and all that stuff. You know, but we're used to that story. Right. So it's easy to make fun of one, but not the other. Right. Exactly. The idea that actually, well, that's fine if it's 2000 years ago, but. We can't do that now. It's too late. Like the, the window's closed for the foundation of new religions. And in fact, um, there's a terrific, you know, this is it's such an interesting area, but, you know, there's a terrific biography of Jesus by a British writer called A.N. Wilson, where you appreciate the extent to which really it's, it's, you know, it's a bit like Lennon and McCartney. It's kind of Jesus and, and, um, and Paul, like Paul, Paul, really got things going. And without Roman roads, Christianity would have been a total non-starter. You know, it, he, was a, he was a regional mystic living in the Sea of Galilee. He went to Jerusalem once, as far as we know, and then not long after was, was crucified. And then it would, have been, it would have remained a small local phenomenon, uh, except that Paul, who was a vastly influ influential um, I, I, a re sort of religious invigilator traveling around the Roman Empire, had his conversion experience in he sort of um, willed it into existence, and it, be and it ended up being the religion of the Roman Empire. And the other one I've been—I haven't—I just started reading this this week. Is um, "No Man Knows My History" by Fawn Brody, uh, a biography of um, uh, the founder of, um, Joseph of Mormonism, Smith. Joseph Smith, and um, uh, you know another unlikely character who 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 kind of. Was a sort of un unscrupulous. Can I say that? I'm aware we're like talking blasphemously on several different levels, but who you know, it's just on the face of it, utterly unlikely narrative in the beginning of the 19th century about finding gold plates inscribed with Egyptian hieroglyphics, and yet here we are. It's a respectable, right? It's a respectable mainstream religious belief in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite books is. And John you talk Crack to you would talk to like Mitt Romney. You need to say to Mitt Romney, like, does this really make sense? Like, you really right. think this happened? And, and he'd say, it has, 100%, to, it has right. to be in the realm of a mythic truth, you know, where Mitt might say something like, "Well, I'm not claiming it's like global warming or the germ theory of disease or something you could prove. This is just what we believe. We're Mormons. That's that's our that, those are our central tenets. So when when people like you or I or Dawkins or whoever goes poking around in there saying, how do you know this is really true? I think that's beside the point for them. This is a different yeah. kind of truth, a religious truth. I totally agree. You know, that's a great phrase, mythic truth. And I often compare it to, to theater. You know, there's aspects of theater. You know, it, to, you can go, I can go to a, a, a Christian service and it will be almost like a theatrical experience, but a very, a very powerful one. So it's in some... It's ceremonial and it's uplifting and it's it's wonderful and I don't really believe it, but the effects are real. And I think there's a I think you're exactly right. I think this idea of true or false or believe or not believe, in some ways, it's much blurrier than that. And there's so much to be gained from taking a more broad-minded view of these and, and sort of getting on board with all different kinds of experience and not overly interrogating what's true and what isn't. Yeah, well, Louis, I know you got a heart out here in five minutes, so I just wanted to get your, uh, you know, what you're working on next, but also in kind of in the context of how many ideas do you have to come up with th that end up then successfully produced as a documentary film? I mean, what I got from your memoir is it's a lot of slogging and spitballing and throwing stuff on the wall to see what sticks and not, it's hard to succeed in that world. Yeah, well, I think because of the nature of the stories I do, they're not retrospective. I am an immersive journalist. Sometimes people say gonzo, you know, <laughs> sort of, which obviously summons to mind Hunter S. Thompson. It isn't quite that, but it's almost more George Plimpton-esque where I'm trying to get into a world and experience it in good faith, get in there and kind of roll my sleeves up and be part of the world and make connections. It takes a lot of work to find, to get the access. We spent two years trying, or maybe even more, maybe two and a half to get to Koalinga, the mental hospital for pedophiles. San Quentin was probably six months. Scientology, we didn't really get access, but they came after us while we were filming, which was a kind of access they began attempting to intimidate and harass me. But that's a story I'd been sniffing around for 15 years or more. So it's, and I typically make about three programs a year. The most recent stuff I've been do doing is a series called Forbidden America, which we're looking for uh, 
to get out on America, like on American TV, it's a there's a, it's a three part, and one is about ext- uh, the new far right among young people online in America, c- centering on a figure called Nicholas J. Fuentes. The second one's about rap in Florida and the trap scene, which is you know in which a lot of shootings seem to be involved at the moment. And then the third one is about porn's Me Too, about the coming uh, the, the the new era of porn in which create people can create their own content and alongside that um there's been a calling to account of various troubling figures like ron jeremy and and a, and a porn agent called um derek hay so i i, I mentioned those because i'm obviously i'm proud of them they're sort of about the so, so, social setting of like you know sort of inflected by social media and the world of virality and also because i'm trying to get those on the radar but um you know, I've started a company, so I'm making programs that I don't appear in as well. Um, and uh, for me, part of, you know, having done TV for 25 years, what's exciting is exec producing other programs, um, you know, on, slightly under the influence of some of these docs that are, you know, doc series that are on streamers like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu, uh, making three and four part true crime series or series with other people in them. So I've been busy with with, with this and that, and I've, my most recent book, which is on audiobook in America, is called. I seem to be plugging everything. I'm sorry. No, that's it's all right. called it's Peru the Keyhole, yeah, and that um, that's too. an account of my life during the pandemic, attempting to stay sane in amidst um, the weirdest kind of global event that I've lived through. And you know, <laughs> yes, we haven't got indeed. time to go, but part of it was doing its follow up to my Joe Exotic film. I spent ten days, more or less. With yeah, ten, not living with because I wasn't under his roof, but spent ten and a half days with Joe Exotic and John Finley and John Rinky in two thousand and eleven. So it's quite weird for me when the Tiger King thing happened and being in lockdown and sort of all these people I knew were suddenly the biggest celebrities on the internet. <laughs> You've done a lot of weird things in America. Are are Americans by character weirder than 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 British? I don't think necessarily they are. I think what you, what Americans are is less self-conscious, so the weirdness is closer to the surface. But I do think maybe there's something in the nature of the American experience, which is an experience of self, a sort of experiment of self-government. You know, and, and there's a there's a utopian impulse underneath. Um, well, there's sort of two twin foundational ideas behind America. We tend to focus on the Pilgrim Fathers, who were there in pursuit of. Uh, um, religious freedom, right? The Plymouth Brethren looking to be able to practice their extreme brand of Protestantism in peace and found a new Jerusalem. So that's a sort of almost messianic or or, religious uh, utopian idea. But then we forget the colonists in Virginia who were purely there to make money and were looking, they're under license from the king and um, trying to grow tobacco, not very successfully. And and they get written out of the story because they're not part of the Thanksgiving event, but they they weren't there for religious freedom. They were just literally there to try and make as much money as possible. And I still think you see those twin impulses in American society, and they they, they sort of underlie a lot of um, the kind of work I do. And you've got such a you know it's a vast nation, three hundred million people, lots of space, plenty of room to start a cult or meet a ufo or a, or an alien and so and for me because i'm half american my dad's american i've always had a sort of foot in both worlds so i've always enjoyed you know that's been my whole life's work really is is sort of living out the other side my sort of secret americanness by experiencing the extremes of life in america that's great that's a perfect place to end it and i'm glad your work is available now thanks to amazon prime and we'll have to have you on again when the next next year when when, when you finish some more weird America expeditions. <laughs> I would love that, Michael. Thank you for having me on. I'm a fan, and I, I look forward to uh, whenever we next speak. So it was a real privilege to be here, and um, and so thanks for hooking it up.